We know film noir for its black and white cinematography, gritty voiceovers, Venetian blinds, detectives in trench coats, troubled dames, and femme fatales with legs that go all the way up. But what if a film doesn't immediately qualify as film noir? What if that film utilizes all the major elements but carries a sardonic tone that at times still takes itself very seriously? What if that film doesn't really look like a film noir right away? What if on the surface that film appears to be an absurdist stoner comedy about mistaken identity, bowling, and a stolen rug? How does that movie fit into the conversation of film noir? And why does it matter? Welcome to film school. You gonna bogart that J all day, man? That's Bush League. Film noir is a genre that emerged during the 1940s as a direct response to the difficulty of the Great Depression. It expressed a collective inner darkness that ran in the veins of America through the 1950s. Its inspirations come from crime novels and German expressionism. It can be recognized by its visual elements such as low-key lighting, high-contrast black-and-white photography, dramatic shadows, and unconventional angles. French for black film, the term film noir was first applied to Hollywood by French critic Nino Frank in 1946, though at the time, most of the film industry simply referred to these films as melodramas. I hate her. That doesn't make sense. Whether film noir qualifies as a distinct genre is a matter of ongoing debate among scholars. Many believe the genre only existed during a very distinct period of time between the 40s and the 50s because of its place in history. But there are more recent movies that adhere to noir's convention so stringently that they start to push the boundaries of classification. This question of classification is further hampered when a film deliberately nails the basic elements and then flips them all for comedic effect. Don't write her and don't phone her. Can I use her underwear to make soup? <laughs> there is no better example of this than absurdist stoner anthem The Big Lebowski. We're gonna spoil all sorts of stuff, man, so just chill out. I'm perfectly calm, dude. First things first, the title. The Big Lebowski is a reference to such film noirs as The Big Sleep, The Big Heat, The Big Combo. It was a common way of making a film feel more important than it actually was. Because early noirs were lower budget, it was an easy way to make a gritty crime movie feel like a big deal. In fact, The Big Deal would be a great title for a noir, but it's ours and you can't have it. We already registered it with the WGA. We're pitching it to Paramount next week. Film noir commonly portrays its cities as busy and attractive in the light of day, but when the sun goes down, the city becomes a vortex for crime. The Cohen City is bright and filled with bursts of neon, but at night, it's flooded with dimly lit streets and creepy nihilists digging into a fair amount of the city underground. Are these the Nazis? No, Johnny, these men are nihilists. There's nothing to be afraid of. The Big Lebowski is a rich, handicapped man who hires the dude to find his missing wife. This is a classic trope of film noir dating back to The Big Sleep, a film with Humphrey Bogart based on the novel by Raymond Chandler. In The Big Sleep, a rich old man hires Marlowe to find his son-in-law. Marlowe visits his client, General Sternwood, at his mansion, who, just like The Big Lebowski, is a rich, grumpy older man stuck in a wheelchair. Sternwood doesn't hire Marlowe as the fall guy like the dude, but in The Maltese Falcon, Bogart's character Sam Spade falls victim to a similar plot. Yeah, well, I think we'd be better off all around if we put our cards on the table. No, I do not think it would be better. Here's another nod to The Big Sleep, Lebowski's character Jackie Treehorn. You know, the pornographer responsible for producing the beaver picture? The story is ludicrous. Well, in The Big Sleep, the plot is set in motion by a pornographer named Arthur Gwynn Geiger, a shadowy figure we never even meet. How's the smart business, Jackie? Jackie Treehorn welcomes the dude to his Malibu estate. While visiting, Treehorn serves the dude a drugged white Russian, a direct reference to Sam Spade being slipped a Mickey in the Maltese Falcon so they can search his apartment. The dude's subsequent hallucinatory dream even has its own counterpart, its inspiration coming from Marlowe's drug-induced nightmare in the film Murder, My Sweet. Another essential film noir element? The femme fatale, the deadly female. She's always willing to seduce unsuspecting men for her own purpose. So who is the femme fatale in The Big Lebowski? In The Big Sleep, Sternwood's oldest daughter Vivian, played by Lauren Bacall, is the love interest and femme fatale. She's sexy and dangerous, but just as witty as Marlo. Speaking of horses, I like to play them myself, but I like to see them work out a little first. Find out what their whole card is. Find out mine? I think so. Maud Lebowski, played by Julianne Moore, has all of Vivian's hubris, but her sexuality has been traded for elaborate feminism. Vagina. And although Vivian relies on Marlo to protect her, Maud has no need for the dude whatsoever, especially once she gets his little spermies. Both characters start out looking like femme fatales, but both turn out to be all bark and no bite. One might say la femme par excellence, if one was so inclined. 
to say such things. But you can't have a noir without a femme fatale. So then who is it in Lebowski? Well, the real femme fatale is Bunny, the trophy wife played by Tara Reid. She's an exaggerated update on Helen Grail, the volatile trophy wife played by Claire Trevor in Murder My Sweet. They both cheat on their clueless older husbands, hiding a past and former identity. I've got a name for a duchess, Mrs. Lewin Lockridge Grail. In The Big Sleep, Carmen is Sturwood's older daughter, not his wife. But like Bunny, she's a rebellious nymphomaniac who also propositions the hero upon their first meeting. In The Big Sleep, Marlowe puts it, She tried to sit on my lap while I was standing up. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I just said. Well, my Bogart wasn't good enough for you people. But unlike Marlowe's caution towards Carmen, the dude has no scruples when Bunny offers him a blowjob. I'll suck you for a thousand dollars. There are plenty of visual nods to film noir in The Big Lebowski. Roger Deakins' cinematography is often lit in the old chiaroscuro fashion. Venetian blinds are a common visual motif of noir, representing a sense of entrapment or the feeling of being imprisoned. Another common visual element is the use of mirrors to distort the image on the screen. In The Big Lebowski, the dude sees himself in a mirrored cover of Time magazine, an impossible reward for the dude, but perhaps in the mind of a robe-toting, jade-toking stoner, a purpose in life worth pursuing. So who is the dude? He's not exactly a private detective. But he is on a mission to figure something out. And like many other noir protagonists, he spends a lot of time getting his face drowned in toilet water. Where's the f***ing money, shithead? Oh, it's, oh, it's down there somewhere. Let me take another look. Oh. Throughout history, film noir sees a range of protagonists who aren't always as cool as Humphrey Bogart. Other protagonists in film noir range from a plainclothes policeman in The Big Heat, an aging boxer in The Setup, an unlucky grifter in Night in the City, a law-abiding citizen lured into a life of crime like gun crazy, or simply a victim of circumstance, as in DOA. The dude fits in perfectly with some of these characters, except for his robe and hair and beard and sunglasses. The dude is a victim of circumstance. He just happens to have the same name as a crotchety millionaire, and he gets pulled into a plot involving a kidnapping all because some Asian-American pisses on his rug. Is it so necessary that the dude have an office with a secretary to be a noir? There are plenty of other nods to noir in Lebowski. The brawn and the little guy, often seen in films that Elisha Cook and Murder My Sweet's Mike Mazurki would have played, are paralleled in Lebowski as the dude's two sidekicks, Donnie and Walter. In Lebowski, the dude is tailed by a fellow Seamus and Cohen regular, John Polito. I'm a brother Seamus! Like an Irish monk? What the f*** are you talking about? In The Big Sleep, Marlowe is followed by noir regular Elisha Cook as well. I've got something to sell, cheap, for a couple of C's. Well, let me stop you. In many ways, the most identifying film noir component to The Big Lebowski is its senselessness in wrapping up the plot. Typically, in a film noir, by the time our detective wraps things up, the world has spawned additional problems, and everything comes tumbling back down. At the end of Lebowski, many things have happened, but none of it really adds up. Donnie dies and they bowl. Maybe that's why Lebowski is so popular, because it balances on the edge of bleakness, but still manages a way to ensure that life goes on. Hey, f it, man. This bleakness was one way critics used to define noir, by its tragic conclusions. But this is a faulty criteria because many canonical noir films possess happy endings. For example, Stranger on the Third Floor, Dark Passage, and The Dark Corner. So even classic film noirs have to make exceptions for their own freaking rules. If the dude abides, maybe our lives are meaningful after all. The Coen brothers have admitted the similarities are indeed references to The Big Sleep. And The Big Lebowski repurposes and utilizes all of the elements of noir, but completely subverts the genre. Yet we're still left with the question, is The Big Lebowski film noir? Well, when you examine it from all these points of view, it starts to feel more and more like a straight noir, and all that absurd comedy is just a part of the dude's trip. So in our opinion... Hello? Yeah. Yeah, it is, see? It's noir. By the books. That's f***ing interesting, man. That's f***ing interesting. Yeah, that's right. Oh, uh, somebody else needs the booth, but I'm gonna keep doing this for a couple hours. But why is the classification of The Big Lebowski as film noir such an important question? It's because the film noir genre is in itself difficult to define. Some critics identify noir's trademark as a distinctive visual style, but others note that there is considerable stylistic variation among the films. So there is no single definitive model because the model is always changing. One film might be more dreamlike, but another can be particularly brutal. In the more than five decades since film noir's heyday, there have been innumerable attempts at defining the genre. 
But as film historian Mark Bould puts it, film noir remains, quote, an elusive phenomenon, always just out of reach, like a dame, like a dame whose games go on to infinity. The quote ended a while ago, but I'm just having fun now. So we want to know what you think. Do you disagree with us? Do you agree with us? Do you hate us? Do you hate yourselves? What are your favorite film noirs? Let us know in the comments below.